So I'm going to talk about radio surveys. I guess it would be helpful at some points in this talk to have the lights down, if we can, if we can do that, the ones at the front at least. Awesome. Um, so there are kind of two different topics in this talk. Uh, the first one is just generally about radio astronomy and radio surveys, radio imaging, which has the, all those things have a lot of unusual characteristics. Uh, and the second one is about a specific approach to using surveys, which is image stacking, uh, where you sort of miraculously get out of empty parts of images actual science. Um, I'm part of the, the first survey, which is a radio survey using the VLA, the Very Large Array, a big radio telescope in New Mexico. Uh, this is from our website. The website is uh, up there someplace, sundog.stsci.edu. Um, this is a survey that started back around 1995. It's actually kind of ongoing, and they give us little bits of time uh, at a time. Um, it's at a wavelength of 20 centimeters, which is kind of a moderate radio wavelength. Um, has a resolution of 5.4 arc seconds over most of the survey. The resolution actually changes as a function of declination to some extent. Um, that's for people who know about the VLA, that's the B configuration of the VLA. The VLA actually changes sizes by moving the antennas around, um, and it changes the resolution of the survey has a one millijansky detection limit. None of this means anything to you if you're not a radio astronomer probably, but uh, covers 9,000 square degrees of the North Galactic Cap. Actually, I could change that number now to 10,000 square degrees. It actually covers uh, pretty much the same area as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, and in fact was designed that way. So when we started um, in, in 1994, 1995, um, we thought that Sloan was going to be finished way before we finished our observations, and, and it turned out not to be the case. So we actually stayed pretty well ahead of Sloan as the, the rate they actually covered the sky. <laughs> so radio surveys. Radio surveys are really weird in a lot of ways. First of all, the sky looks completely different in the radio than it does in the optical and in the infrared and at x-rays, at basically every other wavelength. So if you go out with your eyes and you look up at the sky, what you see is there are about 5,000 stars which are visible to the naked eye. They're all nearby stars. They're all things in our galaxy. There's one external galaxy that you can see with the naked eye in the northern hemisphere. That's the Andromeda galaxy, M31. Uh, if you know where to look for it, it's a fuzzy patch in the sky. Um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can see the, the Magellanic Clouds, which are satellite galaxies to our own. But everything else that you're seeing is local stuff in our own galaxy. Uh, when you see the Milky Way, what you're seeing is the band of stars in our own galaxy. When you look in the radio, it's completely the opposite. Almost all the bright objects in the radio are objects completely outside our galaxy. And in fact, many of them are at cosmologically significant distances. So the radio sky is dominated by extragalactic radio sources. Most stars are completely invisible in the radio. So stars are extremely faint in the radio. Uh, <coughs> a good feature of that is that you can do radio observations in the day or the night. It doesn't matter if the sun is up most of the time. As long as you're, like with the VLA, if you're not pointing within about 10 degrees of the sun, you don't even know the sun is there. So the sun is not bright in the radio compared to all the other sources that we're trying to observe. Um, the emission mechanisms that are producing radio emission are, are quite different than what you see in the optical. It's all thermal hot objects that produce uh, optical radiation. If you go into the infrared, sort of coolish objects. In the radio, the dominant me uh, emission mechanisms in most sources are non-thermal emission, non-thermal synchrotron emission. So it's electrons that have been accelerated to relativistic energies which are spiraling around in magnetic fields and producing uh, a sort of highly beamed radiation. Uh, you also do see thermal emission in the radio. When you look at ionized gas, you see thermal free-free brimstrong brim emission. Um, so because the radio is, is so weird in its properties, it's extremely important, probably more important, I would argue, in the radio than at any other wavelength to when you do a radio survey or you have a catalog to be able to find cross matches for radio sources at other wavelengths. For, for the vast majority of radio sources, there's no way to get a redshift for those objects. 
uh, from radio observations alone. There's no way to determine anything about what the source of the object is. All you have is a spot in the sky that's a radio source. And one radio source, a radio source that's uh, a stellar radio source, there are a few of those, or a radio source which is a galaxy at a redshift of three, may look very similar as far as its radio properties. It's hard to tell the difference from radio alone. You have to cross-match those catalogs. Um, radio sources are very faint in the optical. The median magnitude for optical counterparts to radio sources is about 23rd magnitude. So half the radio sources have optical counterparts which are fainter than 23.5. Uh, what that means is you have to have deep optical observations to find the majority of radio source counterparts and you have to have accurate radio positions because there are a lot of magnitude 23 galaxies out there in the sky. So you have to have a radio position which is accurate enough to say which one of all the possible counterparts is your, your, your actual source of the radio emission. Here are a few examples of fields uh, in the optical. I don't know how this is, not too bad. Um, this is a, a field in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a 10 arc minute by 10 arc minute field. Here is the same field in the first survey. So if I go back and forth, okay, well, you, obviously it doesn't look very much the same. But in fact, you can see counterparts. If you look at this object right here in the middle, do it again. Okay, this guy, it's a little double radio source. This is a typical radio source morphology. Well, there is an optical counterpart for that, actually, a fairly bright galaxy, which is the source of that. There's something going on up here where there's this funny little radio loop. There's nothing visible there, nothing visible there. There is a counterpart for this funny little jet source, okay? So that's a typical, this is not a typical extragalactic field, actually. This is a great extragalactic field as far as first is concerned, because there's a lot of sources with odd morphologies. But it, it's typical for the comparison between the radio and the optical. Here's another field. Again, a, a, a field that's just picked to have an interesting radio source in it. In this case, it's a, it's a bright radio source probably a brightest cluster galaxy or something like that. That's the optical counterpart. So these radio, radio objects, many of them are powered by active galactic nuclei, massive black holes in the middle of galaxies, which are accreting material, accelerating particles, and then they have these jets coming out. The jets blow these big radio lobes, which are long-lasting objects. The, the core of the source where they're, you're right down close to where the particles are being accelerated can be highly variable, but the jets are very stable in their emission long-lived. Here's one more. This is in our own galaxy. We do see radio emission from things in our galaxy, and the, the plane of the Milky Way does show up in the radio. This is an image from the, the Spitzer Glimp survey, 3.6 microns. Uh, when, you, when you look at this wavelength, um, the galaxy is fairly transparent. There still are some effects from dust in the galaxy at this wavelength. Um, and there, there are some, you can, if you have good eyes, I guess you can see some of the sort of dust lanes and things that are present there. But mostly what you're seeing is lots and lots of stars in the plane of the galaxy. Here's the, the VLA radio. This is from a different survey. Radio uh, image of the same field. Again, well, boy, it's, it's really kind of hard to see the difference. If you go to longer wavelength infrared emission though, there definitely are correlations. So this is a combined color image where the red color comes from the 20 centimeter radio observations. The green color comes from GLIMPS 8 micron observations. At 8 microns you're seeing a lot of emission from dust in the galaxy. Um, uh, so, so it does show up some, there, there are things that show up in both the 8 micron and the, the uh, radio. And the blue is the five, Glintz 5.8 micron, so it's, blue is mostly stars. So there are a couple different kinds of sources in here. First of all, if we look at this source up here, this is a source which is ionized gas. So it's an H2 region which is being heated and ionized by uh, star formation and massive stars here in the middle. It has both dust emission and radio emission associated with it. Then there are two supernova remnants here. Supernova remnants don't have much in, in the way of additional, so they show up mainly in the radio, although you can see a hint of dust emission associated with this one. This is a very, very uh, bright supernova remnant which has essentially no associated infrared emission. 
Here's one more color version of this image. Actually, I made these color versions through our web. We have a website that, that supplies the images for this uh, galactic plane survey and also has access to the glimpse images. So I made these through the website. Um, um, this, now I've changed it so that I have 20 centimeter red uh, glimpse 8 micron emission in the green, and I replace the blue with radio 90 centimeter emission. It's lower resolution, so it's kind of, the blue is kind of fuzzy looking. But you can see now that this has a very different radio spectrum. This supernova remnant has a, a very steep, it's called radio spectrum, where it's very bright at the long wavelengths at 90 microns, which is uh, 90 centimeters, which is typical for uh, uh, supernova remnants. This one has a, a flatter spectrum. You don't see much in the way of 90 centimeter emission. And this is this thermal emission, which is a flat spectrum. It's probably the same brightness at 90 microns, which makes it faint at 90 microns. Well, how do the telescopes work that make these observations? I mean, when I was a graduate student, this is what telescopes looked like. Basically, and it's still true, there's still telescopes around. They're big, massive, monolithic things. Mostly when people are building telescopes now, they don't look so much like battleships. This is the 100-inch the uh, telescope on Mount Wilson Observatory, which was a, a spectacular telescope for astronomy. It was built around the, the turn of the 1900s. Don't remember exactly what the year was. 1918, okay. There are pictures of, uh, of parts of Mount Wilson Observatory being taken up, taken up the mountain with mules pulling the wagons and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, but radio telescopes look very different. This is a picture of the VLA Observatory. The VLA, as I said, it's, it's in New Mexico. It consists of a lot of individual telescopes, all of which get hooked up together electronically to act as one large telescope. The telescopes are actually built on, on movable platforms and they're railroad tracks, so there's a three-armed configuration and you can move with a lot of effort, and they do this about every four months, you can move the telescopes to expand the array or to contract the array. There are other kinds of interferometers. So the important thing about the interferometer is what is the arrangement and spacing of all the elements that go into the interferometer. Um, this is an interesting example. Uh, some people took the, the Keck 10 meter, one of the Keck 10 meter telescopes, which is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So this is a 10 meter optical mirror, and they masked out all but the, the little bits where the dots are shown in order to turn Keck into uh, an optical interferometer. Um, which seems like a crazy thing to do. You've got all this glass, you know, why would you use only these tiny little bits of it? Well, it turns out if you do that, you can get much higher resolution optical images. What you get are images that look like this. If you take a single one of the images, you get an interferogram. It, it looks kind of funny, it's kind of fuzzy. There's a lot of stuff going on here because it's smeared out by the atmosphere. But if you look at the power spectrum, I talked about uh, Fourier transforms. So you take the Fourier transform of this, the power spectrum is extremely regularly spaced and in fact is filled in by all the sort of spacings between these pairs of apertures. Turns out you can use the, this kind of data, do analysis of it, and get much higher resolution observations. The highest resolution observations that I know of from the ground have been done with this kind of configuration. So the goal of interferometer arrays is to sample the visibility, it's called visibility plane, or the Fourier transform of the image uniformly. I'm not going to talk too much about the mathematics of it, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of an intuitive feel for how it works. The, the, the idea is to, and this is, this is from actually another talk, minimize side modes am amplitudes, maximize, maximize signal to noise and resolution. Uh, and redundancy and spacings is undesirable. There are lots of interferometers around. This is the submillimeter array on Mauna Kea and Hawaii on top of this extinct uh, volcano. So the Keck Observatory is sort of around the corner from this. So you start out with an interferometer. It's a collection of telescopes at, at some positions on the ground. Um, so what you do is you, the, the, the thing that's important about these arrangement of telescopes are the baselines between all the pairs of telescopes. So each of those baselines uh, samples a point in the Fourier plane and the sampling of the Fourier plane, basically you take the thing that matters is the length 
and the orientation of the baseline. So you can shift them so that they're all, all have one end in the middle of the Fourier plane. So this yellow, the, in the dots, the yellow arrangement of telescopes samples these points in the Fourier plane. Um, if you have a, a, a telescope like the VLA, the VLA has 27 antennas. It samples 27 times 27 minus 1 over 2, 351 baselines in a single snapshot observation. Here are some other examples of, of uh, interferometers, microwave background imager, submillimeter array, which I showed before, the Sunyai of Zeldovich array. This is actually from another talk I give where I talk about why uh, if people who are interested in numbers. Why, it turns out, these have four, uh, Fibonacci numbers of antennas. If you know the Fibonacci numbers, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, here's 8, here's 13. Turns out it's not just a coincidence that, that Fibonacci numbers are a good, uh, actually a design characteristic of interferometers, and that's a whole separate talk, which I'm not going to do today. But. So there are a lot of curiosities of radio images that come from the, the fact that they're, they're uh, created from these interferometers so that they're sampling the Fourier plane. One uh, of fact is that what you're measuring, the data that you're collecting, looks nothing like an image. What you get is this basically time series of points from all the different baselines and each one of those points is a time and an amplitude and a phase. And it's basically a big table of numbers and none of those numbers have any connection to the brightness of a pixel or an object on the sky. So you have to do image processing, data processing in order to even create images to work on. Uh, it's also necessary to do deconvolution uh, de uh, because if, if you don't do deconvolution, then what you get is an image which is extremely contaminated by the, the, by the pattern of the radio telescopes on the ground. Um, and it's, it basically has been convolved with something that radio astronomers call the dirty beam uh, because it makes a mess. And you have, for a single point source, you have uh, light, basically, in the image all over the map. Uh, in, and in, for a three-armed array like the VLA, I should have, have put in an image, I didn't think to do that, but a three-armed array like the VLA, uh, what you have is lots and lots of side lobes and things all over the map. You have to do a uh, deconvolution or cleaning process on it to have an image which is usable. Um, artifacts uh, in the image are, are global. They extend all the way across the image. This is related to this characteristic of Fourier transforms that I talked about Yesterday, the, the fact that if you change a single Fourier coefficient, which is what you're measuring with an interferometer, then you make a global change in the image. So not only are the beams, do the beams extend all the way across the image so that the point spread function is global, but also noise is global. If you take a single point measurement and you introduce some noise in your system, then you shift the value of that one point. That introduces waves across the map. So the noise is not a local pixel by pixel thing like you think of in optical images where you can look at the noise and think of it as a localized phenomenon. Lo noise is a global phenomenon in radio images. The resolution of radio images is determined by the spacing of the elements. If you put the elements farther apart, you get higher resolution. If you put them closer together, you get lower resolution images. The field of view of a radio telescope, though, is determined by the diameter of the individual antenna elements that make up the array. So if you have bigger antennas, then, then the, the effect is that the field of view for the telescope becomes smaller. If you have, because the field of view is determined by the diffraction limit, uh, a sort of shape to a response of the, I'm fumbling for words here, but it's determined by the, the, the diffraction limited size of an image made by that single dish. If you make that dish bigger, then the diffraction limit becomes smaller. That means your field of view becomes smaller. So it's actually good to have an interferometer made of lots of small dishes rather than a fewer big dishes because the small dishes have a wider, produce a wider field image, so you get a wider field of view in one snapshot. Um, in radio imaging, because you're making the images and you're starting from this Fourier sampling, there is no natural pixel size. You get to choose your pixel size. 
Usually you choose your six pixel size to be something like one third of the size of the res res ultimate resolution that you expect in the image, but it could be something smaller than that. It could be bigger than that. It's, it's a sort of uh, an adjustable parameter of making the images, which is kind of an odd thing. The noise in the radio images, when you've made these images and you look at them, the noise doesn't look like white shot noise where it sort of scatters up and down from pixel to pixel. The noise looks like white noise that's been smoothed by the point spread function. So the noise has the same kinds of shape as sources, uh, sources in the image do, which is another funny characteristic. One of the funny things about radio imaging, I would say we've been doing this for a long time. The VLA started observations in the late 1970s and was fully in operation by the early 80s. Um, uh, and interferometers have been around longer than that. But current and future telescopes, like the, the EVLA, Extended VLA, which has been in operation for about a year now, uh, ALMA a telescope, which is uh, in construction down in Chile to do millimeter observations, it's a telescope called LOFAR, the Square Kilometer Array is a planned project in the future. They all produce wide field, very wide bandwidth data. So they produce a tremendous quantity of data. And everything in this data varies with wavelength. So I said that the field of view is determined by the diffraction si size of the, of the individual dishes at a particular, uh, at, at the wavelength that you're observing. If you're observing at a whole range of wavelengths, in the EVLA now, it's easy to do observations that go from, for instance, one to two gigahertz. Or, or so they observe over a factor of two in wavelength. Well, the field of view of the telescopes changes by a factor of two over that size. The size of the resolution changes by a factor of two over that size, because it also scales with the wavelength. The brightness of the sources changes over that size. And what you're getting is one sort of big blob of data, but everything is varying across the data. Um, the existing algorithms that are used for processing radio images all have shortcomings. When you get into this regime where you're trying to do wide imaging or wide field imaging, wide bandwidth imaging, I would say that there's no algorithm that exists which is clearly the right thing to do. And the algorithms that do exist can be very computationally intensive. So, so this is an area where having access to big computers could really help. I mean, you generate a lot of data. There's a lot of processing that needs to happen. Um, and I, I think we don't know what the best algorithm is, but whatever the best algorithm that ultimately arrives, it clearly is going to take a lot of computing. There's a lot of room for improvements. If you have an interest in this sort of thing, this would be a good field to go into. And ALMA is, is going to be a really fantastic instrument science it's it's going to be a, a it's it's going to have a huge impact on science and it's a jump of something like a factor of 100 over previous uh, uh, millimeter telescopes so it's going to open up the high redshift universe all sorts of super high resolution imaging of star formation and stuff like that Here's an example of, of some wide bandwidth imaging that we've been working on. This is the, the Galaxy uh, M33. We've done an EVLA uh, set of observations. This is, a, a, I think it's about 16 hours worth of data that we have for this 1 to 2 gigahertz bandpass. Uh, so it's not very much data. Um, so after working on it for a few months, we create an image that looks like this. If I go back and forth, actually, you can see lots of connections between, for instance, if you look at this region up here of star formation, there it shows up brightly in the radio. So there are plenty of sources where you do, you can see clearly associated with star formation regions at M33 that there's radio emission. This is a survey which is mainly intended to look for uh, supernova remnants in M33. Uh, so when supernovae explode, they leave behind these expanding remnants, and after a uh, uh, few hundred years, they produce lots of non-thermal radio emission. They're accelerating particles at these expanding shocks. So here, because we have 1 to 2 gigahertz, and we haven't figured out exactly how to process this data, but we have a, a low frequency band and a high frequency band. The difference between the shapes, there are actually, uh, I think there might be seven different pointings mixed in here. The difference in the shape between the, the sky coverage of the two is because of the difference in frequencies, meaning the field of view is different. 
uh, uh, we've taken out as many of those effects as they can. Something that you can see up here is there's this, this one bright source off in the edge of the field. This is doubtless just an extra galactic source, which is someplace you know, far, far behind M33. You can see some of the art, imaging artifacts, side lobe artifacts from those, all these sort of things that are sticking out here are, are all imaging artifacts. There, there's nothing real there, but that's an example of the, the kind of global artifacts that you get in these radio images. Uh, this is an image where we took those two bands and put them together to get a spectral index uh, uh, distribution for the objects in the images. So this is the science that we're trying to do right now. So, so that's the introduction to radio. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about image stacking. So uh, I, I said in, in the talk I gave a couple of days ago that, that catalogs are a key tool and a key product for surveys. It's very clear that the vast majority of the science that's been done, for instance, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, came from the catalog that was created from the Sloan Survey, not from people going back to the images. They produced an extremely high quality catalog, they produced great tools to use it, and everybody does science with the catalog. But there are some kinds of science which requires access to the original data. You can't do it from the catalog, and one of the prime examples of that is image stacking. So the idea of image stacking is you can, you can look at empty regions of the data that you have, but you can add up for some class of objects. So if you have a catalog, I'm going to talk about uh, quasars. We have the Sloan Quasar Catalog, which overlaps the VLA first survey. We can look at uh, the positions of all those quasars in the first survey, whether there's a source detected or not and add up all those images and get much deeper radio images of the average brightness of sources uh, in some external catalog. So, so the idea is to, to be able to study the properties of classes of sources uh, at a much deeper level than you can do from the actual data that you can collect on individual sources. So the first survey is great for stacking. It has wide sky area. It has very good astrometry. You need to know that you've matched up your catalog, that you're going to pull the images out with, with the image, images. Um, some details of how stacking works. Um, first of all, we use, and this is pretty important, when we're calculating, we have this whole stack of images that we've extracted at a bunch of positions. We calculate for that stack, not the mean brightness of the stack, because if you do that, then if there's some random bright source that appears someplace in one, nearby one of those images, it'll show up as a big bump in the image, and it creates a lot of noise. We use the median in the stack. So pixel by pixel, we calculate the median brightness. That's a far more robust calculation. It's a very well-defined calculation actually. I mean, it, you can do median statistics, you can do the same way you do mean statistics. You can calculate what the noise is on the media, and you can calculate upper and lower uh, limits on the, the bounds. And it's, it's much less sensitive to the occasional interloper or outliers in the distribution. Um, another effect it, that we have to worry about, and this is, this is way down in the noise as far as the details for, for what you're concerned, we have to worry about an effect called snapshot bias in the images. The images that we create are not actually perfect radio images in some sense with a linear response to brightness as a function of, of the brightness of the true source on the sky. There are biases that appear, and those biases we found to our surprise go right down to sort of zero flux in the noise. So we're detecting things way down inside the noise, and we can still see evidence for these kinds of biases, which clearly are all the result of the way the images get created through this complex deconvolution algorithm. But we don't understand it in detail exactly where these come from. Now, one of the cool things about doing image stacking is you're comparing two catalogs. And this, in the case I'm going to talk about, we have a catalog from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a catalog of quasars. That was created, there was a selection algorithm to pull objects out of the Sloan Survey to try to find the quasars in the Sloan Survey. It's complicated. It uses the colors of objects. It uses the brightnesses of objects. Maybe the morphology can get used. There was a, a follow-up observation where they got spectra. There was selection of objects to, for which objects to get spectra of. So there's a lot of complications that depend on the sensitivity of Sloan and different colors, on the colors of the objects that you're trying to discover. Um, 
If you ask the question, you know, well, how many of those are radio sources? and you match against the first survey catalog, for instance. You can do that. People have done it. But that introduces yet another set of selection criteria, which are what went into the radio catalog? How did you detect sources in that catalog? What determines when you get near the flux limit of the catalog whether a source appears or not? So there are selection effects that appear in the radio, too. When you fold all those together, the understanding exactly the population of, of objects that you're finding is very complicated. The cool thing about image stacking is you do no selection in the, the band where you're doing the stacking. So in this case, we're stacking radio images. We're not doing any selection. There's no bias introduced in the radio at all. We're just stacking up all these images, regardless of whether there's an object there. So all the, the need to understand exactly how the selection effects affect your results goes away on the radio side and you can think only about the optical selection and that's a huge simplification because understanding selection effects is a big part of understanding statistics of catalog analysis. So a little bit about radio quasars. So quasars were originally discovered as radio sources actually. The first quasars that were discovered up in, back in the early 60s um, were discovered as the optical counterpart to radio, radio sources. They're called quasars as uh, it's a, uh, what do you call it, portmanteau for quasi-stellar radio sources. So there were radio sources and there were objects that people could see were probably the counterparts, although in those days the radio source positions were so poor it was hard to be certain. Um, and those objects looked like stars. They didn't look like galaxies. They didn't look like nebulae or anything that you could understand. Um, uh, it, it's now seen, it's now known that the, the vast majority of quasars are optically discovered by their colors and are not radio sources. Only about 10% of quasars are radio sources. The distribution of radio luminosities for quasars is really kind of weird. There are lots of quasars which are uh, sort of radio quiet. They don't produce very much radio emission. The radio emission is very weak. There's this handful of 10% of quasars which are extremely luminous radio sources. They produce tremendous amounts of radio emission. So it's nothing at all like a sort of Gaussian distribution of radio luminosity. It's a distribution where most things have sort of low luminosities in the radio. And then there's this tail off to extremely high luminosities, which are the things that produce the radio bright uh, emission. Uh, I would say that the reason why some quasars have bright radio emission, but not all quasars or not no quasars, is, is still something of a mystery. People are making progress at understanding this, but it's hard to understand exactly what's the difference between radio quasars and non-radio quasars. There have been lots of studies of the optical properties of those quasars, and it's difficult to find any differences between them and the optical. So the goal then is to use the largest radio and optical surveys, the first survey and the Sloan survey, to investigate radio quasar emission. If you look at quasars and the optical, this is a composite quasar spectrum going from the ultraviolet, sort of far in the ultraviolet, to the near infrared. This is in rest wavelength in the quasar frame. So as quasars redshift, Typically, if you saw a redshift zero quasar, you would, in the optical, you'd be observing over this band pass. But as you go to higher redshift quasars, the band pass shifts down to, to, to farther, sort of far, farther and farther into the ultraviolet. And eventually, you start to see these ultraviolet lines. Um, this is, uh, these are composite spectra from several different sources, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Large Bright Quasar Survey, and Old Quasar Survey, and the First Bright Quasar Survey, which are radio-selected quasars. Um, quasars have a remarkably consistent spectrum overall. There, there are these power law spectra, essentially, which are dominated by a non-thermal emission from the nucleus, although there are various thermal components in here. There, there are these very broad emission lines, these emission lines which show velocities up to maybe 30,000 kilometers per second of gas flowing out of the quasars. And the emission lines are highly ionized. Uh, uh, things like uh, triply ionized carbon, ionized lime and, lime and alpha emission from hydrogen, magnesium-2, and so on. So these, these, this is what quasar optical spectra look like. Uh, I won't linger on this because you've probably seen it before, but the idea is 
the, the theoretical model is that there's a massive black hole, maybe 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 solar masses in the middle of the galaxy. There's gas that's accreting onto it. The accretion ga accreting gas forms a disk. And that disk then drives jets out the polar direction, in some cases radio jets. It also, there's a lot of uh, uh, luminosity that's being generated, and there are clouds of gas which are being ionized and accelerated out from the middle of the galaxy. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which Alex talked about on Monday, um, one of the products of the Sloan Survey was a, a catalog of quasars, which was far bigger than any, any previously existing catalog. We were, did this calculation with the SDSS DR3 catalog, which had 46,000 quasars in it, of which 41,000 were in the first survey area that we had at the time. Um, all these objects have accurate photometry in the five Sloan bands. Um, they also all have spectra, so they actually have known measured redshifts. So they're very accurately classified as quasars. They were selected as outliers from the sequence of stars. So if you look at the colors of stars, stars have certain characteristic colors. Quasars have colors which are quite different because of those, the funny shape of the spectrum. Uh, so, so Sloan quasars were selected as things that don't look like stars. Um, in their colors, and, and uh, um, that has certain selection problems. When you get to redshifts around three, which is actually near the peak of the Sloan quasar, or at the, near the peak of the quasar distribution in redshift space, um, the, the locus in color space of quasars as they're going out to higher redshift and getting shifted goes through the, the or very close to anyway, the stellar locus. So it becomes hard to select those quasars. There's a lot of contaminant from stars. So the, the effect, efficiency of Sloan in selecting quasars is a function of the redshift. It's a function of the color of the quasars. So if you have quasars with odd colors that push them into the Sloan bands, then they're easier to find. Or if you have quasars with odd colors that push them out of the stellar locus uh, colors, then it makes them easier to find. So there's a lot of funny effects there. But on the whole, it's, it's a uniform, well-selected, well-defined sample. So if you look at uh, the, the first catalog, the radio catalog, about 10% of the Sloan quasars are detected in the first survey. Um, this is the fraction of quasars as a function of redshift in this catalog, which have first survey counterparts. There's a funny bump here around a redshift of two and a half to three. That's because one of the criteria that Sloan used to decide whether an object might be a quasar, so they should get a spectrum of it, was a match to a first radio source. Um, so. Uh, in, this, in this redshift two to three band where it's hard to actually identify objects because they look like they have the colors of stars, a much larger fraction of the objects that got picked out as Sloan quasars were picked out because they were radio sources. So this is purely a selection effect, the fact that this goes up uh, as you go across here. But overall, what you can see is it's around 10%. It declines slowly toward high redshift, but uh, it's, it's a, a fairly constant level. All right, stacking quasars. So here's the idea. We're going to take these 40,000 quasars. We're going to stack up all, we're going to extract images from the first survey for all those quasars. And then we're going to calculate the median brightness of those. And this is a movie that shows as, a, as we start out with a, a few images and then add more and more and more in some random order. I don't remember what the order is. What we see in the stacked radio image. So it starts out at the beginning, one, two, three, and what you can see is that you know, you're not seeing anything. Notice that the scale is expanding here, though. By the time we get up to around 100 sources, actually there's a detectable source in there. Uh, so so uh, at, with 100 uh, observations, we're going 10 times deeper. There's a square root of n effect. By the time we get to you know, 10 or 20,000 sources, the image becomes very stable. Okay? So this is what it looks like when you get to the end. Most of the structure that you could see there at the end, there were still bumps left, but most of that structure 
is the, the, the radio beam, the radio point spread function, because the cleaning process that deconvolved the beam from the images um, did not work on images that were buried down in the noise. The way the clean algorithm works, which is what, what gets used in the radio, the clean algorithm works on sources that you can see, but it doesn't clean sources that are below the detection limit in the image. So this is what the image looks like. This is a, a radio profile through the image. This band here is the level of the noise in the image. Most of this structure here is real structure in the image, as I say, that comes from the point spread function. And the, no the final noise in this image is down in the, the, the few microjansky level, where the original images, the noise, the, the individual first survey image, the noise was at the level of about 150 microjansky. So we've reduced the noise in these images by a factor of 100 or, 100 or so. All right, so because we can easily detect these, these uh, uh, objects in stacked images, so the mean brightness, and you know, we can determine the brightness of, of a group of sources. We don't need all 40,000 quasars to be able to detect it. We can slice up that sample of quasars any way we want and then do image stacking just in bins. So for instance, we can divide it up by redshift, we can divide it up by the optical magnitude. We can't divide it up by its radio properties because it's not detected in the radio in any, any one of these images. But we can divide up the sample according to the optical properties in any number of different ways. And we still have plenty of signal to noise in the bins. Um, this is applied as a function of SDSS magnitudes, faint on this side, bright on this side. Um, uh, and this is the 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 flux density, so the radio brightness in the stacked image, as a function of the SDS magnitude. So first of all, you can see that clearly there's a very strong and, and very clean, in this case, correlation that the brighter the quasar, the brighter the radio flux. Okay, so that's nice. Um, that's, that's something that we can understand, and we, we need to take account of that when we're looking at other properties of quasars. We have to take account of the fact that the, the radio emission is correlated in brightness with the optical emission uh, so that we don't find, our, find every test that we do from here on out swamped by the correlation between radio and optical emission. If we, an, another thing that you can do here, we know the redshift of every one of these objects. We're not required to stack images only in flux space. So we extract these images from the first survey. Each one of them is calibrated so that it's, it gives a measurement in Janskys or millijanskys per pixel in that image. But we don't have to leave it in those units. We know what the redshift of the quasar that this snapshot came from. We know how to scale that image so that it becomes a radio luminosity map in true rest frame luminosity rather than just an observed apparent radio flux map. We can use the redshift to scale all those. We do that scaling before we do the stacking, and then we stack those radio luminosity images. This is the result of that. This is the correlation between the Sloan absolute magnitude, so basically a measurement of the absolute luminosity versus the log of the radio luminosity, and there's a terrifically good correlation. It's not exactly linear. It's a power law correlation. So actually, the radio luminosity increases somewhat more slowly than the optical luminosity. And then uh, the, the next thing we can do is we can look at this ratio between the radio and the optical luminosities that we're deriving from all these stacked images. Um, and that's a number that's called the radio loudness. It's basically a measure of, you know, the, the, a measure of just this, the log of the ratio between the radio and optical brightnesses of the source. Um, this is the radio loudness as a function of redshift. Um, and so the, the, the slicing has been done in, in redshift space, but the stacking has been done in this radio loudness space. So again, we scaled all these images, so each image was a radio loudness image uh, before we did the stacking. So there's a lot that you can learn from these sorts of things. For instance, here's an interesting one. This shows as a function of color. This is a Sloan G minus R color. And there's some funny stuff going on in here to take out various systematic effects. But as a function of color, where it's defined so that 0 is a typical color of a quasar, 
So if you have quasars that are bluer than a normal Sloan quasar, they fall on this side. If they're redder than a normal Sloan quasar, they fall on that side. This is the radio loudness. So what you find is that normal colored quasars are actually the, lower, the lowest radio brightness objects on average. Quasars that are either bluer or redder than average are brighter in the radio. And the reddest quasars are actually very bright in the radio, so very much brighter in the radio than, than uh, normal color quasars. Um, so all this stuff is, is helping us to understand what's going on in radio quasars, what's different in qua radio quasars. As I said, it's been very hard to find differences between the properties of radio and non-radio quasars. This is really giving us a handle on it. The radio loudness distribution which we can now calculate over, over a wide range between, from, from sources over at the very radio, radio loud end. These sources are detected in the radio as bright radio sources, uh, down to sources which are in the, the sort of sub-noise level uh, band, which are only detected in the, in the stacked images. Uh, we can study this radio loudness distribution as a property of a lot of different things. It's been a, there's been a long time discussion about whether there are, there's a dichotomy in the radio loudness distribution where there are two distributions. There's a low luminosity distribution and a high luminosity distribution. And there have been many versions of this kind of plot shown over the years, which claim to show notches in between the, the radio loud and radio quiet <coughs> quasars. And in fact, if you look at this, it does look like there's a little bit of a notch here. Uh, but I would argue that this, this apparent shape of this distribution is, is very much created by color selection effects and, and other kinds of selection effects in the optical quasars. Oh, that's really impossible to see, isn't it? Um, what is the blue here? I I'm not even sure what the blue is, so maybe you don't have to see it. But uh, if you look at ro low redshift quasars, redshift less than a half, this is what the distribution looks like. If you look at quasars between redshift two and a half to three, that's where Sloan had that problem. We've actually excluded quasars that were selected because they were radio sources in this band. But nonetheless, there are some funny effects. There's a huge notch that gets created uh, in that band because of the difficulty in selecting quasars of normal colors. And I said that quasars are, their radio properties are affected by the colors of the object. If you're unable to, de to detect or to select objects which have typical colors, you wind up selecting the atypical objects, and they have atypical radio properties. Because they were right, because stars at that at that redshift have colors that are very, or stars have very colors that are very similar to quasars at those redshifts of two and a half to three, and they know about this problem and they do corrections for it. But in fact, it's very hard to correct for it, as it turns out. Uh, it's only a problem in that it takes a lot of telescope time to get spectra of loads and loads and stars. They did some, uh, they did a subsample where they did that. They basically selected all objects in some band and they created a complete sample. That was the way they determined what they th thought their efficiency was. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then this is one more sample. This is, these are objects which are selected to, deliberately selected because they're redder than the typical Sloan colors. And again, the, the radio loudness distribution is, is quite different. So the, it's, it's pretty clear that the overall radio loudness distribution, the one that looks like this, uh, is, is very much a combination of a bunch of different distributions which are affected by different selection effects and how many objects there are in different categories uh, in some complicated way. So I, I think we don't really uh, have an answer yet, but I, I would argue that uh, a lot of what appears as a, a dichotomy here is the result of selection effects. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, we've done a lot of studies on broad absorption line quasars. I mean, one of the, the few known connections between the optical spectra characteristics and radio characteristics is that a class of quasars known as broad absorption line quasars, and here are some, uh, some examples where you have not just emission lines, but you have absorption lines. Uh, 
along the way. And there are some very extreme examples. Here's one where there's so much absorption that it's almost absorbed away the, the continuum emission. Um, broad absorption line quasars are radio quiet. It was stated for a long time that there are no radio loud broad absorption line quasars. That turns out not to be the case. There are a few, but it, radio emission is rare among broad absorption line quasars. When we look at the stacking results, though, what we see is the opposite, is that broad absorption line quasars, when you stack them up, are brighter in the radio than non-broad absorption line quasars. And that's kind of odd. Well, how does that happen? The way it happens is if you look at the, the, the basically the fraction of sources that are radio emitters, what is this? Cumulative fraction versus radio loudness. Okay, so this is a radio loudness distribution of of non-broad absorption line quasars that's in the green. So basically, the, the Sloan quasar is actually excluding the broad absorption line quasars. Uh, and then two different classes of broad absorption line quasars, ones that have high ionization lines, ones that have low ionization lines. Those are in the red and the, red and the blue. So the radio loudness distribution. So what you look at is in, for, for bright quasars, okay, the, the radio emission is rare. The, the broad absorption line quasars have lower radio loudness, so they fall below the normal quasar distribution. But when you look at faint quasars, and this is from the stacking results, the, the results change direction. The, rate, the radio, uh, the low ionization broad absorption line quasars, low balls in the red, uh, are brighter in the radio for faint sources, for for things that are not really radio loud than normal quasars are. So there's some funny connection going on between uh, the broad absorption line emission, and there have been arguments about whether broad absorption line quasars are uh, just the same as, ev that every quasar is a broad absorption line quasar if you see it in the right direction. Uh, this argues against that because uh, radio emission tends to be basically uniform. It doesn't get hidden by optical obscuration, for instance, by dust and things like that. Uh, so this argues that broad absorption line quasars are actually a different evolutionary state of quasars. You're seeing them at a different time. So in summary, the, the radio surveys are unusual in, in their scientific content, the fact that everything you see is extragalactic, just about, um, and in the data characteristics. The image characteristics have a lot of odd features compared to images that, that you're mostly used to looking at. Um, and as I said, the problem uh, that we're increasingly facing of making wide field, wide, uh, wavelength band interferometric images is really not a solved problem at this point. It's a computationally intensive problem and we don't know what the right algorithm is to use. Stacking images is, is a, a great way to do science with surveys. It requires access to all those images, which means there's a lot of data involved. For instance, if you're going to do stacking with the the LSST images, you might want to do stacking as a function of time for time variable sources. I mean, there's all sorts of things you could imagine doing. Uh, LSST is going to take 30 terabytes of data a night, so you're going to have a lot of data sitting around that you need access to to stack. Um, one of the, this does point out one of the values of doing unbiased surveys, surveys where you're not just doing pointing at objects that you know are there. People have said, you know, why do you need to do a survey like the first survey where we survey 10,000 square degrees, we do 60,000 pointings, uh, and most of those fields you see, you know, 20 objects or something like that. Wouldn't, wouldn't you be better off for many kinds of science, for instance, if you wanted spectral indexes for all of those, just to do pointed observations at all of those. You don't need to observe all that empty sky in between because we now know where the radio sources are. Uh, but if you do that, you can't do things like stacking. You need to have all that empty field because it's not really empty. There's actually science in the empty parts. Uh, a great feature of stacking is that it does completely eliminate the selection biases in the, the wavelength of the images that are being stacked, so that really simplifies your understanding of the data. 
Uh, and stacking 40,000 Sloan quasars reveals a lot of interesting characteristics of quasars and radio emission from quasars, which does illuminate some of the phenomena we've been trying to understand. That's it. Um, well, it, it depends on the, the quality of the data, I would say. You, you do have to worry about these kinds of biases. Um, and if you had images, I mean, in the radio images, mostly we don't have to worry about backgrounds because the background tends to be zero. You don't make the uh, same argument about x-rays. The number of photons is quite small. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's been a while. I haven't gone back and looked at the X-ray stacking analysis since we did the first stacking analysis. And an interesting question, for instance, is, as I said, it was very important for us, and it was a big breakthrough, when we started doing median stacking, medians of stacks rather than means. Uh, medians of stacks might not work very well in the X-rays. If you have an image which, imagine a photon counting image, which where most pixels have zero photons, when you stack all those up and take the median, the answer may be zero, <laughs> you know, because it may be that, that for most images, most pixels, there are no photons in there, and so you don't get any answer. Well, medians never get, that's the thing about the median. The me, so the median will never be dominated by a few sources. Means could be, right. So if you use means, you can be totally dominated by a few sources. Uh, I mean, I, I've worked with people who, you know, I, I've had to convince them that they should be doing medians because they start out and they say, well, I'm going to do means, but then I know that there are these occasional sources, like in my stacks, I'm looking for 100 microjansky sources, but there are occasional objects in there which are one -jansky, so they're vastly brighter. Okay, you don't want to just average, okay, so I'm going to put in a flux cut and I'm going to exclude things that are detected above some limit in my stack. Oh, when you've done that, already now you've just introduced a bias in the radio regime, which you're going to have to model ever after uh, in, try, in order to try to understand exactly what you've done to the distribution. So it's very complicated. Yeah. Use the median and don't put in any cuts, then you can be happy. Uh, now, now, I think it would be an interesting thing to try this with Chandra and just see if you just use medians. But if you, if you do have problems with backgrounds that, that fluctuate violently from one place to another, that also can cause some funny problems. I'm yeah. not saying that this shouldn't be done. I'm, I was just, I mean, it's a great thing that, that we've got all these different catalogs and we can cross correlate and, and learn all sorts of things. Yeah. You just have to understand what you're doing and be careful. I'd agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's my only uh, point. Alex looks like he has so it. So when you compare, I don't remember now the. So when you compare the optical to radio um, flux ratio, mm -hmm. then you also then on the optical you also compute the median. No. Well. Um, so what, what I'm doing in that is I'm selecting optical sources in bins. So, so I select optical, so, so all, the, all the optical sources in one of those bins have the same optical luminosity. Uh, and so that's the, right, so it doesn't matter. Yeah.
Yeah, there is. Uh, there's a, a student at, uh, uh, where is she? I forget where she is. Anyway, there is a student who, who was working on redoing the stacking analysis using the most recent, both the most recent first data and the most recent Sloan data. But, um, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of open game. Uh, for somebody else who wants to do this. We've done this kind of stacking analysis with a number of other samples. For instance, we took the Sloan um, sample of uh, uh, red clustered galaxies, massive red galaxies. We've done it with a bunch of other Sloan samples as a function of star formation rate. So radio emission is a function of star formation rate. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting results which come out of that where you can see evidence for AGN, faint AGN in galaxies. And it's clearly faint AGN because it, it eventually becomes uncorrelated at low star formation rates with the star formation rate indicators. Um, so you can stack lots of different kinds of sources. Um, we've mostly gone in the direction of picking uh, uh, optical sources and then in the radio regime, um, but Alex is interested in going the other direction, and, and it's partly because we haven't had all the Sloan data in a form where we could we could do the stacking in the other direction ourselves. But uh, but but you could do that. You could do it in the other direction too. Take radio catalogs or catalogs from other things and stack them in in the in the Sloan domain. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.